Thank you very much. Uh, so it was a great honor and pleasure to give this talk. Uh, give this talk here. So thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, what I started together with uh, a student of mine, Cédric Troussard, in 2010, which was having a new look at uh, the BMS algebra and uh, trying to to give a different kind of spin on it in light of uh, more modern developments. Then I will talk about uh, conserved charges, or I should say would be conserved charges. And since I do not want to integrate, I will talk about the current algebra instead of talking about the charges. I will also spend a bit of time on uh, something which has come up, which is the central charge in this in this context, and it depends on the fields in a very particular precise manner, and in the end, I will try to go from the algebra to the group. Excuse me, the microphone can be... Mm -hmm. I think, yes. Is it better now? Okay, I speak loud. Okay, very good. Uh, so that's what I will try to talk about. Usually when I talk about these things, uh, I first do everything in three dimensions and then I move to four dimensions because a lot of the intuition that we got came from three-dimensional asymptotically anti de Sitter gravity and then three-dimensional asymptotically flat gravity and then we move our way up to four dimensions. But today I will try to do everything first from the four-dimensional perspective and then if I have time maybe I say something about the simpler three-dimensional. Okay. Uh, so in some sense, uh, one of the main ideas about asymptotic symmetries, one way to think about them is uh, to think about them in the same uh, as residual gauge symmetry. So for instance, in ele electromagnetism, imagine that you fix the Lorentz gauge. So d nu a nu is equal to zero. And then you can ask, how many gauge transformations do you still have? And what do they do for you? So the gauge freedom that you have left is uh, uh, box epsilon is equal to zero, and the question is, can you get something out of that in that context? So in, in gravity, one point of view you can take is it's very similar uh, to that. So one way to interpret this uh, bondi metzner sachs ansatz which you can find in these uh, uh, two papers we sort of discussed yesterday, so you can think of it as a kind of of course, physically motivated gauge fixing ansatz in which you put, uh, in which you put, uh, oh, I am not finding the pointer, in which you put a zero here, you put a zero here, so this is the a null coordinate if you put up the inverse metric, here is the radial coordinate, and then you have uh, two angles if you are in four dimensions, one in three, and more angles if you are in three dimensions. Uh, so, if you put these zeros up here, this gives you d minus one gauge condition, so you fix g u u and g u a to be zero, and then you need one more condition in order to have d conditions which fix your diffeomorphism invariance in d dimension. So, and what people have chosen in this BMS uh, ansatz is to put the determinant condition, which says that the determinant of the uh, of the uh, spatial part here of the angular part of the metric should really be the determinant of the leading part of the metric which they took to be the metric on the round sphere. But uh, I will do something slightly more general which is to keep a conformal factor in, term, uh, in front of this metric on the round sphere which is exactly the conformal factor that we have seen yesterday in the case of robinson troutman waves also. So, the determinant condition you can either fix it with respect to the round sphere or you can stick in this arbitrary conformal factor because then you can talk about more solutions that you do not have to squeeze into the BMS gauge. So I think the phi here was called uh, lambda uh, in, the, in yesterday's talk. So then you have, uh, you have D conditions and you can expect that this fixes diffeomorphism invariance for you in D dimension. But then if you really look at what happens, you see that you have some leftover uh, symmetries, and this is the BMS. So you have to complement 
this uh, gauge fixing condition with fall, fall off conditions. And of course, the choice of these fall off conditions is very important because they determine what is in your theory. But if you are only interested in fixing the asymptotic symmetry group, you can take them very weak, okay, much weaker than uh, what you would need or what has been done in four dimensions. So for instance, you can take them uh, just beta should go to zero, uh, just should go to zero uh, at some rate, but to zero you don't need order of r minus two. Uh, and the same for u, the same for v over r. And you are saying that this angular part of the metric should just go to just be, let's say, the metric on the sphere plus something which goes to zero. So that's enough to fix the symmetry algebra. Of course, if you have physical motivations, you can, you can do better. You, sometimes you, uh, you should uh, choose stronger conditions. But for the symmetry algebra, this is enough. And what is interesting, in this sense also, it applies to polyhomogeneous space times if you have logs or this kind of thing. It doesn't really affect the derivation of this asymptotic symmetry algebra. So that's what we're going to fix. And then you are looking, so you're looking at uh, the diffeomorphism leaving this class of space time invariant. So that's like computing killing vectors, uh, especially for the components which you fix to be zero. So if you go to the metric instead of the inverse metric, you have to keep GRR zero, GRA, uh, this should be a capital A, you keep it zero. And this is keeping the determinant condition. And then when you solve these equations, you find that keeping these exact conditions just fixes in your asymptotic killing vectors completely the R dependence of this asymptotic killing vector. So the Xi u component should be, uh, is a function that can depend on u and on Xa, but no longer on, on R. So this you get immediately by looking at this equation, and similar for the other equation. So for instance, the Xi r component of the asymptotic killing vector is completely fixed in terms of uh, Xi u and Xi a. And then you try to preserve your, so you want uh, your transformation to, so to map one asymptotically flat solution to an asymptotically flat solution. So you have to preserve this fall of condition. And when you look at what these conditions tell you, uh, in detail, they just fix the u dependence of this f and of this uh, small y. When you work it out, you find in the asymptotically flat case, in anti it's different. In the flat case, you find that this uh, small y is just independent of u, and this has to do with the fact that the induced metric is degenerate at sky. You can, you can look at that uh, like this. Uh, the phi dependence of the, uh, uh, the u dependence of, uh, of this object here is fixed by a simple differential equation that you can solve. Uh, and it's very simple in term in case this conformal factor does not depend on time. But if, as in Robinson Troutman waves, this conformal factor depends on time, it's a bit more complicated than what you are used to. Okay? So if the conformal factor is just the conformal factor of the, so if it's just one, you get t plus one half times uh, the uh, dA yA, and d bar a is the covariant derivative with respect to this angular power. So in the end, you stay with uh, two integration functions, which depend both arbitrarily on the angles. So t of uh, theta phi and y of theta phi. And the last condition which you get from preserving this thing here, which is in some sense the most important condition, is that this capital Y should be a conformal killing vector of, the, of, of this power. And then what you're going to find uh, is that in five dimensions, of course, the, you have a conformal killing vector of the, of the three sphere or the higher dimensional sphere. And this, you get a finite number of solutions. You only get the right SO uh, transformations, which, are the, which is how the Lorentz transformation looks uh, from sky class. So the Lorentz transformation you find as the uh, conformal killing vectors of the sphere of the right dimension. But then you get absolutely no constraint on this uh, f function here, uh, sorry, on this t function here. And this means 
that if you impose this very weak fall of conditions, you would have super translations in all dimensions. Of course, you can impose, and I think we are going to hear more about this this afternoon, if you, if you really look at gravitational waves, you can have fall of conditions which are stronger, and you can use them to, to kill off the super translation and to reduce yourself to the Poincaré algebra in, uh, in higher dimensions. But then in four dimensions, so what people have done, and you can really see in this paper, so, so far I have just exactly followed uh, this paper by Sachs, the computation I've sketched is just exactly this computation. Uh, and then at this stage, he's saying, now let us look at the solution, and we know that the the globally well-defined solution of the conformal killing, or the conformal killing equation of the two sphere is the so he finds SO31 as the globally well-defined killing vector of the two sphere. So, and then he says one should expand T into spherical harmonics, and in this way you have a, a symmetry algebra in which uh, everything is globally well-defined. Of course, after conformal field theory, so people who look into quantum field theoretic, conformal field theory books, uh, somehow you have exactly the same situation. Uh, you have the conformal uh, killing vectors of flat space. And the choice that you do in that case is to allow uh, for meromorphic functions. So the conformal killing vectors, you say, the solutions, if you use stereographic projects and to make it, uh, to make the round sphere, uh, to make it flat up to this, conformal factor. So the solution is arbitrary functions of zeta and zeta bar. Or if you do an expansion in terms of, you can do an expansion in terms of Laurent series, then you would have this type of generators. And in order to have a consistent algebra, you also should extend your, um, expand your super translation generators also in terms of uh, Laurent series. And then, if you work out the algebra you get in that case, is you get two copies of the centerless Virazoro algebra, which commute, which encode what you could call super rotations, if you want. And they act in a semi-direct way on the generators of super translation, uh, which form an abelian ideal inside of this big, uh, inside of this big algebra. And then you can see how the Poincaré algebra sits in this, uh, big uh, infinite dimensional algebra, and it's just the lowest modes as usual, so L minus one, L zero, L one, the same with bar, and the lowest T zero is just described for you the Poincaré. So this is exactly the same setting then in the original papers. The only thing that you are saying is if you allow singularities, gen you have more generators. That's all that you are saying. Can you write some this will come. This will come because that's usually the central extension comes when you look at how the, al the symmetry algebra comes in terms of Poisson, uh, let's say, generators for the transformation. In terms of Hamiltonian generators, you get central extensions. And that's exactly what's going to happen. But on the level of the algebra itself, there is never a central extension. It comes when you look at representations. And, and, uh, Exactly, exactly, and we will get something like that, exactly. It's a bit clearer in three dimensions for BMS3, but uh, they, and that's what I'm going to talk about today, is central extension. Okay, of course, yeah, so there has been, uh, of course, a lot of work on this, uh, since the 60s, and uh, of course, so maybe just as a, a side comment, uh, in the exhibition upstairs there is papers by people uh, who have King's College as an affiliation, uh, some important papers in the field, and maybe people have missed uh, two. One is the Penrose Lectures by Penrose, which is also signed from King's College, and the other one, which is relevant to what I want to say is a paper by Newman in Nature in 1965, uh, whose point is to say that if you take BMS4 seriously as a group of, of symmetries, then maybe you should study unitary reducible representations of the BMS4 group 
instead of studying unitary irreducible representation of the Poincaré group in order to classify elementary particles. So this was the point of this paper here and of a similar paper by Coma. Uh, a similar paper by Coma in Physical Review Letters in 1965. So what are the unitary irreducible representations of the BMS form? Then you can ask the same question here, which would be, what are the unitary reducible representation of this version of the BMS4 group? Because either you can study it as a mathematical question, or you can take it seriously and see what kind of particles this, this would give you. Okay, something else that has been done is that this, uh, well, uh, these symmetries now have been used to, to say something about soft graviton and soft proton theorem. So people say that there's a way to discuss uh, the soft graviton and the soft uh, uh, photon theorems as word identities for these uh, BMS symmetries, which of course very nice and should be, should be understood. That's not the computation we have done in, in 2010. The computation we have done in 2010 is to see how this transformation acts on your asymptotically flat solution. So that's the computation we have done and present. Let me maybe make two, before showing these results, let me make two uh, technical comments, which is that uh, when you look at these asymptotic killing vectors uh, here, so you see that the killing vectors depend in their subleading components on the metric themselves. So, what is nice about this derivation by Sachs is that the subleading parts, which you, usually you give as order of something and do not work out, is completely worked out in Sachs's paper. There is an implicit expression for it, because there is an integral from R to infinity, and, and you have an expression for it as soon as you give yourself beta and g. Okay. And then, if you take that into account, you can ask, in what sense does BMS4, is it represented in the bulk space time? So the point is that if you use the right, the right bracket, which is a modified bracket which takes the dependence of the, of the killing vectors on this metric into account, so if instead of the usual Lie bracket, you use a bracket which is modified by the dependence of Xi on G, in this bracket, you get a representation of the BMS algebra as in terms of the vector fields in the asymptotically flat four-dimensional space time. So you need to use this structure in order to, to have a linear representation. And, okay, and this bracket is something that you can find in mathematics literature. It's not, uh, it's called, it, uh, it naturally arises in the context of Lie algebraids instead of Lie algebras, where you have, for instance, structure functions and not only structure constants. Yes. So with this bracket, you just get an uh, honest, linear representation in the bulk space time of the BMS algebra. So that's one technical comment uh, that you can do. Another technical comment is that you also should do, in this case, maybe not just BMS transformation, but you also should do, should look what happens with wild transformation. So the motivations to keep this conformal factor of phi of u theta and phi of p of u zeta and zeta bar arbitrary, so you can give many motivations. Uh, one motivation is because you, you still know the general solution to Einstein's equation in that case. So this is basically the work by Newman and Unti, because if you look at this work, until the very end, they keep P arbitrary, and they still have a parametrization of solution space. So you know what is going on. The second motivation would be uh, you can think of this, uh, this conformal factor as the leftover finite ambiguity when you define asymptotically flat space times in a more geometric way through uh, conformal compactifications. So you strip away this infinite factor, but then you have a finite ambiguity, and this conformal factor is precisely a finite ambiguity in that. So it's also uh, a reason to keep it from that point of view. And the third reason is the one we saw yesterday, uh, which was that if you want to study robinson troutman waves, uh, the whole dynamics is precisely in the u dependence and in the zeta zeta bar dependence of this conformal factor here. So 
you can do, if you study Robinson Hoffman, well, you can do, from this point of view, you can do two things. Either you work in that representation, which is very nice, or you can try to squeeze them into BMS gauge. But this is a very complicated gauge transformation that you, uh, coordinate transformation that you have to do. And in some sense, you rather would like to study them without having to go to this, uh, to this thing. And keeping this conformal factor and talking about wild transformations allows you to do precisely that. So when you ask the question, which transformation leave the BMS metric invariant up to shifts of the conformal factor, you can solve exactly the same equation. And all that changes is that in your asymptotic killing vectors, you just have to replace this conformal factor, which is the divergence of the, uh, this y d bar a y a by a shifted conformal factor, which contains this uh, this wild scale. So in that case, you're talking about a larger, let's say, symmetry group is maybe not right, but a larger group of transformation, which is BMS4 with wild transformation. And that can be useful for some cases. And then the last technical thing is that all these conformal, so the first computation we did was like in the bondi metzner sachs approach, uh, was in the metric formulation, but it can be very useful to do everything in the first order Feldman formulation because, uh, or in the newman penrose formulation, because of course it makes the conformal structure much more manifest. It makes much more manifest what is happening, so of course uh, it's strange to talk about this kind of thing in front of this audience, so let me just say quickly, uh, or maybe, so how, how you can think about it. So you take a first order Carton formulation in which uh, instead of the usual uh, Lorentz connection, uh, you use, you change the space time index of the Lorentz connection into, a, uh, into a, a tangent space index. So you have this spin coefficient here, which have number of space time index. And the you choose a null tetra, uh, uh, and then you give names to all of these uh, all of these coefficients. And an important object for what follows is this uh, x and x bar derivative. And one way to think about the x and x bar derivative it's just a complex derivative uh, if p is equal to one, and if p is not equal to one, it, this x derivative is just a covariant derivative of on this two-dimensional surface. So it just encodes. And all the Christoffel symbols are, of course, contained in, uh, can be computed from the value of uh, the, when Then you look at conformal killing vectors, the equation, even when p is arbitrary, is exactly looks the same as the equation looks when uh, p is equal to one. And the transformation law for a field that you can expect in that case is very similar to what you see in conformal field theory. So, you have transformation laws in which you have a certain conformal weights, which have to do with uh, x of y and x of uh, y bar. And you have conformal dimensions, which are related to uh, the spin and the conformal dimension in the gravitational approach. So this is just to make easier the translation to what people from conformal field theory expect when you present uh, the results. OK, and then about the very nice thing about uh, what people have done in that context is that they have a very good idea of what is the general solution to the equations of motion with these asymptotics. So they know the free data that you have to give in order to fix uh, solution space. So, and in this uh, formalism here, the data that you have to give is one wide component at a fixed time u, but you have to give its radial dependence. That's the data that you have to give inside to specify a solution. And then you have to give data at scry. So some of the data, it's enough to give it at a fixed time. So the leading part of this component of the wild tensor and the real part of this component of the wild tensor. And then you have uh, one function which is, whose u dependence is not fixed by an evolution equation, which is the asymptotic part of the shift. And if you choose to work with this p, there is also p which can depend on it. And the evolution equations here are part of Einstein's equation, but you can, of course, solve them in terms of initial conditions, which is this kind of initial conditions. 
And then when you look at what happens to leading order, you just have uh, to leading order the Einstein's equation just tell you how some leading parts of the spin coefficients are related to, uh, to each other. So everything, in fact, is determined by giving this, and then you can, uh, you can build up the solution order by that. Note that if you keep P, uh, the U dependence of P arbitrary, the news is a bit more complicated than just being the, the time derivative of the asymptotic part of the shear, but there is a correction term here which has to do with the time dependence of the conformal term. Okay, in any case, uh, the, okay, this is what you have. It is a bit slow. Okay, when you work, so you have worked out, so in the end, this PMS transformation adjusts the diffeomorphisms which map asymptotically flat solutions to asymptotically flat solutions. So by going one order further, you can work out how they act on solution space. Uh, the computation we did in that case was first with P, which didn't depend on U because everything is easier. So I'm just describing the results in that case. So what you find then is that the asymptotic part of the shear so, uh, has the following transformation law. So you see some conformal dimensions, which is three halves and one half, but uh, you see also how it has to transform under while transformations, and you have here x, x squared of f, where f is basically the super translation, but also in, uh, one half u times uh, the conformal factor, there should be a plus here, the conformal factor. So this, of course, was very well known and, and uh, discussed a lot in the gravity literature that uh, the asymptotic part of the shear transforms with the x squared of the super translation. Here you get if you allow for super rotation, you get a bit more. You find that uh, the, the new tensor uh, is a, a field which has conformal dimension 2 and 0, and which transforms, if you would be on the Riemann sphere, it transforms just with the, Schwarz, with the third order derivative of the conformal killing vector. Okay, so you see that the transformation law of the new tensor is exactly what you can recognize from the transformation law of the uh, conformal field of, of the stress energy tensor in a conformal field theory. It has exactly the same transformation. So this bit, in a sense, is new, I would say. And then you can work out how all, how all the other uh, quantities transform. And then there is the question how to interpret this transformation. Of course, for super translation, this was discussed a lot, a lot in the gravity literature. But then somehow now people from field theory also came with new ways of interpreting this. So one way of saying this is that the Minkowski vacuum is, is described by the asymptotic part of the, of the shear being zero. And you see that sigma zero being zero, since this is an inhomogeneous transformation, or breaks PMS invariance. And if you ask what preserves sigma zero being zero, you find that you get back to ordinary translation and not super translation. So, uh, and of course, the same for super rotation. You see that if you don't have news, uh, so uh, the breaking is given by d, d squared of, of y. And if you're asking that there is no breaking, if you ask that the vacuum goes to the vacuum if you want, then uh, you are back to ordinary rotations. And, okay, and then uh, people have talked about Goldstone bosons and things like that in this context. But there is a simpler way of, of talking about this from the point of view of classical solutions which is just to say that the Minkowski vacuum has a non-trivial orbit under BMS transformation. So you take a BMS transformation, you act on the Minkowski vacuum, and you generate an asymptotically flat solution which is no longer the vacuum. Okay, that's asymptotic. Which is asymptotically non-trivial, absolutely. It's a, absolutely, absolutely. So it's a different morphism, but, and the way to to understand that it's non-trivial is to compute some surface charges and see if you change surface charges by that. This is, would be the criterion to say why it is still why it's a large gauge transformation and not a small gauge transformation. 
why you should think of it as having some effect. Yeah, because the patient is unique. If there is no something yeah. to this patient's unique, it is a very unique nature. It's because it's called free. No, no, but, but this is with respect to, yeah, of course. With respect to asymptotic, of course. But this and is. So gravitational is also known for this transformation. I understood it as a sense of yours. Can you no, no, no. Okay, let me say what I can. It means, for me, classically, it means that you act on Minkowski, on Minkowski space with a BMS transformation, with, and you generate an asymptotically flat solution, which is a different solution. No, but this was known before. Yeah, this it was, was known. No, no, of course, of course. I'm not, I'm not saying more than that. The rest, you. But okay, these people got interested, and there's things that that you can try to do. I mean, to think again about this thing. That's also a very good thing, independently of how you think of of words. So. Um, Yeah, for, for instance, I, I, I learned recently, which, which I didn't know, that doing a finite super rotation on the Minkowski vacuum is something that had been done before. So there, there was a paper by Nutku and, and Penrose which, which pre did precisely this. And when you were looking at what you are generating, when you do a finite super rotation, meaning uh, zeta goes to another function of zeta, what kind of solution are you generating? I should not comment on that, but, uh, but it, it is precisely in that context. You would do, this would be like doing a super rotation on the back. Um, and then you have singularities, which you have to discuss, because, uh, but, but you have something that you can discuss. OK, and now to your other question, which is, what about central extension? In order to talk about central extension, you have to talk about charges, or you have to talk about currents. You have to do some representation. So uh, either you can do, OK. And one problem that you have to face, which we have to, had to face when you try to build uh, uh, conserve, when you, when you try to build charges for super rotation is because you have singularities now, your charges are going to, some of the charges are going to blow up when you try to integrate them over the sphere. Okay, because you, you now have singularities, you try to do an integral over the sphere, you are naive and your charges are going to blow up. Okay. So one thing that you can do, which was a kind of trivial solution that we came up with, is just not to integrate. And instead of doing the integral, you just work with the currents. So instead of, do, of working with the integrated Bombly mass over the sphere, you just work with the mass aspect and you look at current conservation. That's also something you do in quantum field theory, where you can do a local version of world identities, but you can also do, which is, you can work with, uh, with currents, and the, the divergence of the current is what generates the transformation. But there's a classical version of this current algebra, which says that if you have a global symmetry, and you write the formula for the Noether current, which says that the divergence of this symmetry is the symmetry generator contracted with the equations of motion, uh, then what you can prove, what you can prove is that the D of this transformation minus the, so you do a bit of variational calculus, and in the end, what you can prove is that if you go with one, if you act with one symmetry on the kernel of another symmetry, you find the commutator, the, the J of the commutator of the symmetries up to trivial symmetries, where trivial symmetries mean symmetries that vanish on shell for all solutions of the equations of motion, and up to uh, currents which are trivially conserved because they are the dh of some uh, n minus 2, 4, if you want. But if you do this computation, you only can prove it up to possible central extensions because you only prove it under the DH, so there is a possibility for central extension, which is very well known in mechanics. So in classical mechanics, this is, for instance, the central extension. The most famous one is the one in the Galilei algebra, I would say, where the classical extension in the currents really is the mass, if you want. And these trivial terms here are, of course, the standard trivial currents that you use to improve 
if you do a Bellefontaine procedure or things like that, these are to be considered as trivial currents from the point of view of global sea. And then it turns out that this central extension that you have in complete generality, so there has been field theory examples, weight is not only constant, but so in, in mechanics it's just constant usually, but in field theory this central extension can depend on the field. And then the co-cycle condition that the central extension has to satisfy has to take into account the field dependence of this thing, and it's a bit more complicated than the condition that you have on the Virasoro algebra that it is a central extension because of this field dependence. So you get this additional, this additional Okay, then you have to address, uh, since we're not interested in global symmetries, but we're interested in gauge symmetries. I will show, I, I will give, I, I will compute it, uh, in a sense, yes. Uh, okay, let me just first do the standard thing, because then you have to face the fact that you want to compute charges associated to this asymptotic symmetry, and uh, when you just look at the Noether's first procedure, you find that uh, the, the Noether charges associated to gauge symmetries are always trivial Noether charges meaning that they vanish on shell. But you can do something more. You can ask for a classification. Instead of trying to find all conserved currents, meaning all n minus 1 form whose dh is 0 for all solutions of the field equation, you can ask, you can try to classify all conserved n minus 2 forms, which is asking which dh of a form built locally out of the fields and their derivative vanishes for all solutions of the equations of motion. When you do that, you can prove that the only solution, uh, well, the solutions in Lagrangian field theories are classified by gauge transformation which do not act. So in a sense, by gauge transformation such that the resulting gauge transformation gives zero. So for instance, in electromagnetism, you find that the only solution is epsilon is equal to a constant. This classifies your conserved n minus 2. In gravity, in order to have a conserved n minus 2 form for all solutions of the equation of motion, you would need to have a killing vector for a generic metric. And then you can prove that the generic metric doesn't have killing vectors. So people have proved rigorously that there's no non-trivial objects like that. So conserved for all solutions of the field equations in full general relativity. But of course, if you linearize gravity around any background solution, then suddenly you have solutions to this equation here. Because then what you are looking for is the killing vectors of the background solution. So for instance, in flat space, you suddenly have the Poincaré algebra which appears, but for flat gravity, uh, sorry, for linearized gravity. So, and then you can construct, there is a constructive way to build out of the killing vector of the background solution, the associated n minus two form. And in linearized gravity, this is an object that is conserved in time and in space, if you want. So you can go into the bulk, but you will have also time conservation in linearized gravity. That's why this kind of charges can be used, for instance, to, to do the first law, where you go from infinity to the horizon and then interpret uh, things in, in, in this way. So that's in linearized gravity. In, the asymptote, in full gravity, things are different. So first, you ask for a bit less, because you only ask what happens at i is equal to infinity. So you only ask what happens on a certain surface, which means that this n minus 2 form for r, a constant at infinity, just becomes an n minus 1 form. So it becomes the current of a lower dimensional theory, if you want. And then you ask for a bit more because suddenly, so because you have no complete theory of what to do is, you just take the expression that you compute in the linearized theory and you stick in the asymptotic killing vectors that you have put there. But then you have no guarantee that your theorems are going to hold, that the thing is going to be conserved or the thing is going to be integral. And, and so that's one way to think about asymptotic charge. So if you do that in the asymptotically flat case at null infinity, precisely the two things that I was mentioning are happening. The thing, the charges will not be integrable and they will not be conserved. But the good thing is that you can control how much they are not conserved and how much they are not integral. So the first one probably to have done this is what? So, uh, so you take your 
your n minus 2 form, you put it uh, at r is equal to constant, you compute the relevant components, and you try to see what is the biggest part that you can integrate. So the integral I call ja, and then just decorate it with the right, uh, <coughs> with the right uh, p factors in order to make it of the right spin weight. So, uh, so for instance, if you do this computation, you find that the biggest integrable part just contains what people knew all the time, which is the Bondi mass aspect and some version of the Bondi angular momentum aspect. So this piece here, psi 0, 2 plus sigma 0, sigma bar dot 0, is really the Bondi mass aspect. Okay, so that, that's, that's what you find in this piece. Uh, what we have computed more is also compute the other spatial components of the currents, if you want. And the computation we've done is we act with this transformation uh, of solution space, or a transformation which goes on solution space on these currents, and then we compare to what you get to the commutator that you have here. Okay? And what you find is that this non-integrable piece gives an additional contribution that you didn't expect, and you have a central extension in which you so you have the two things, up to boundary terms, which are clear. That's what you're going to find if you do it. So uh, this is a computation I like a lot. And in order to motivate to you why you should maybe also like this computation, I'm trying uh, to show that it contains, for instance, the massless form. So uh, one. OK, one way to see this is, uh, well, OK, first of all, there is this central extension. So let me uh, answer what the central extension is. So the central extension in that case is just, so you see that it has to do with the curvature or the gradient of the curvature of the two-dimensional surface. So it looks like a conformal anomaly from that point of view as well. And it has to do with the third-order derivative of the superrotations, which is exactly how it is also in uh, conformal field theory. So the third order derivative of y is, but here it is multiplied by a field which gives it the right dimension in order to be a, a central extension for the Virasor algebra. So, so this is what happens. So Virasor itself, of the is also forms here. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Ah. Absolutely. Here you can see, but the central extension instead of being a constant, it will depend on the asymptotic part of the shear. Which is, uh, OK, that's what happens in the computation. That's all I, I can say. So, and then you can ask, when does it vanish? It vanishes, for instance, when you are on the Riemann or on the Rauden sphere, so when r is equal to a constant, uh, and when there are no super rotations, so when this uh, thing is zero, it vanishes, so that's good, in a sense, because you understand why people have never talked about it, which makes sense. And OK, so that's one thing you see. And then this current algebra, it encodes the current non-conservation if you choose for Xi1 just a BMS symmetry and for Xi2 just t is equal to 1, so just the mass. If you do that, then the current algebra reduces to the equation which describes you by how much the Bondi mass, or, or and I, I should say maybe not the Bondi mass, I should say all of them, I should say all BMS currents are not conserved. And then you can look what happens for the Bondi mass by, by specifying further and taking psi, just this psi is still equal to 1. And then you just find precisely the Bondi mass loss form for the Bondi mass aspect. So this current algebra encodes what is happening for all of them. And then you can also check if, in the best possible cases, from the point of view of the current algebra, everything is fine. So suppose that you do not have news. You are on the Riemann sphere or on the round sphere. You do not have super rotations. Then you get a completely standard current algebra with conservation. Of course, your symmetries then that you are describing is just Poincaré. Or, I should say, globally well-defined BMS transformation. They have so in that case, you get to this current algebra, which is something you would expect. OK, and then you can also try to do a bit more formal things in order to understand in what sense this 
field-dependent central extension is an anomaly. So you can do an analogy with what happens in uh, quantum field theory with the other Bardeen anomaly. So you know that the non-abelian anomaly satisfies a set of consistency conditions, so uh, descent equations. So what you do is you introduce ghosts uh, in your theory, which is just you make the parameters of your Lie algebra anti-commuting. So uh, from that point of view, when you introduce the chevalier eilenberg differential is just encoded in that way. These are the gauge transformations of the gauge potentials. And then you know that the Adler-Bardin anomaly is the object that appears when you do the descent equation from the characteristic class trace of F cubed to the primitive element trace of C5. If you do this descent equation, you find that the Adler-Bardin anomaly is just here. It's uh, the ghost number one, four degree uh, four uh, functional, which if you integrate it, is VRST in the And here you can do something completely similar. You can, and to simplify, let us work on the Riemann sphere, so let us take P is equal to one, let us replace the generators of super rotations by anti-commuting variables, the generator of super translations also by an anti-commuting ghost which depends on C and C bar, and then you can encode the transformation law of the asymptotic part of the shear in this formula. You can package all components of the uh, field dependence central extension into um, a two form of ghost number two, and you see that it also satisfies a descent equation which allows you to show that it's non trivial as, a, as an element of this thing. So it has a very similar thing. It also had to do with the question we had yesterday on the relation between this conformal anomaly and uh, the central extension. You see that they have the same kind of behavior under, uh, under this kind of transformation. Okay, maybe a last comment uh, about this is that if you have the Virasoro algebra, uh, so the non-centrally extended, usually what you do when you find the central extension is uh, you introduce an additional generator in your theory, which you call Z, and you modify your commutation relation, and in the extended algebra, which contains Z, there is no longer any central extension. So from you go from the Witt algebra to the Virasoro algebra by including uh, the two co-cycle into the algebra, if you want. So you can try to do the same thing here. But of course, here you have to do it in the case where everything depends on the fields. And the good thing about this uh, Lie algebra is that there is similar theory for uh, extending Lie algebra. So people know what is the cohomology operator, the analog of the chevalier eilenberg operator for Lie algebraids. So everything is a bit more complicated because your structure functions really depend on the field. So your Jacobi identity has a, bit, a term which takes this field dependence into account. Uh, the, how the symmetries act on the field, it has to form a representation of this algebra. And in this context of Lie algebra, this bracket that I have shown before with this modification here is completely natural. And if you have a two core cycle in this Lie algebra, then you can build the extended algebra, which is just you can take your initial structure functions and put the two core cycle with an additional element to, to build the big algebra. But if you really want to do that in this case, you have to be able to drop all spatial boundary terms. Okay. Because okay, it's only in that sense that you have a gamma of omega 2 is equal to 0. Because if you're not allowed to drop the spatial boundary terms, then it's, it's like for the adler bardeen anomaly. Uh, then gamma of this is dh of something. So you want this thing to dis disappear upon integration. But this means. If you want to drop all spatial boundary terms, it means, in a sense, that you're no longer integrating on the sphere like you would do. You're really integrating like in conformal field theory. You have to, in conformal field theory, you have series in Z, in, in Z and zeta bar, and the integral is given by the residues that you take. And then, if you take this integral, then you can drop all boundary terms. So, all this thing drives you towards really doing things no longer on the Riemann sphere, but in, in terms of like, vertex operator algebras and Laurent series, where integrals really have these properties. So this is very much work in preparation. It's not done, but, but this is where the direction where, we, where the formulas push you to go.
Okay, and the last subject I want to treat is you can try to do the finite transformation. So you can try to integrate. So, for, so far I've just described the algebra for you, the BMS algebra and the, uh, uh, how the algebra acts on solution space. But of course you can try to build the group and see how the group acts on solution space. So what you really want, want to do, which you can do in the newman penrose formalism, is exactly the same on the level of the group instead of on the level of the algebra. So what you should do is find the local Lorentz transformations and the diffeomorphisms that leave the newman penrose unti solution space invariant. So this would give you the group. It would integrate the BMS transformation. And then you would look at how the group acts on the solution. So that's the computation we have been trying to do. And not surprisingly, you find that the BMS group in that case is uh, at infinity chiral uh, changes of coordinates, either zeta goes to another function of, uh, of zeta only, zeta prime to another function of zeta prime. There's parameters for super rotation. And there is complex while rescalings if you, if you want to allow for this. So these are two Euler solvers? Yes. yes. And uh, these are in super rotation? These are the, the parameters. Yes, exactly. 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 Well, and then you have this while transformation if you also want to do something like that. And, uh, well, everything is quite complicated if your factor p depends explicitly on u. Because for instance, if p depends explicitly on u, it turns out that the standard time coordinate is not a very good coordinate because it has not a good transformation law, if you want. But you can redefine define implicitly a new coordinate, which we call u time, which takes the u dependence of this conformal factor here into account. So you have to do, and in fact, you realize after the fact that it's exactly this transformation that people have done in order to squeeze robinson troutman waves into the BMS cage. It's exactly this kind of transformation which appears. But from this point of view, it is the coordinate which has the best transformation properties because it is uh, wide invariant and it has the transformation property which is basically the same that you have when p is equal to 1 or when p is, equal, uh, is on the limit scale. Okay, and but but since we wanted to do to, to do both, we kept uh, both of these transformations. Okay, and then you work for for a long time, and and you and you you see how your solution space transforms under this finite transformation. You get some pattern in here which remind you of uh, which are completely regular patterns. So what you're using is really you're using the representation of the of the Lorentz transformation, for instance, as you can find in uh, Chandra Sekar's book, and then well, you try to find what is the best way to do the computation, and you end up with something like that, which is not very telling, but, uh, so, but this is what you end up. So this is how you think transform when you do uh, a finite BMS transformation and a finite while transformation, but then you realize that everything is, of course, much easier including the evolution equation, when you first do everything for p is equal to 1. So you first work on the Riemann sphere, the evolution equations, the operators just become du is just du, no gamma term involved, the et just become the standard thing, and everything, so everything on the Riemann sphere is easier, the news is just uh, the time derivative of the asymptotic part of the shear, this is just uh, the second order derivative, and then you, can, you realize that you can generate the solution for arbitrary p from this transformation law by doing a while transformation. So, and, uh, uh, yeah, did I say that? Ah, yeah, I can say that. Okay, first of all, I should also say that uh, what you also should do is when you solve the evolution equation, you solve them in terms of some initial conditions. Okay, you have this evolution equation, and, and there is some freedom in the choice of, in terms of which initial conditions you are going to solve the evolution equation. And our criterion, what we choose as initial condition, or what we choose to parameterize the solution by, was what had the simplest transformation formula. And the simplest transformation formula was not really given 
by the naive thing you would expect, but there was a term that you should add, which was the edge squared of the, uh, of the asymptotic part of the shear. Right? So, and then you, you see, you look at what the Bondi mass looks at in terms of this initial condition, and you just work out the transformation. So, you parameterize your solutions by suitable U independent uh, initial conditions, and the way to generate, to generate the solution uh, for arbitrary P is to do a bile transformation. So you find that if you know what happens on the Riemann sphere, you know what happens for arbitrary P if you do this transformation, which involves this U tile coordinate. So this depends on U, this depends on U tile. But for instance, you see that sigma zero for arbitrary P is related to sigma zero on the Riemann sphere by basically x squared of U tile. So you have exactly transformation laws which tell you how to go from one situation to the other. So as soon as you know what happens on the Riemann sphere, you know uh, you, you can compute what happens for arbitrary. So that's something nice about this wild transformation. Maybe it has been known. It was a surprise to us uh, in any case. And uh, of course, everything comes from the uh, the interesting bit again comes from this uh, from this bit of the wild transformation, which is not which also looks like a Schwarzschild derivative. OK, and then you can, so another way of saying this is that you can parameterize what happens for arbitrary p by, by, choosing, by choosing this parameterization of the solution, so this psi r of u tile. And then you compute how this object transforms under uh, BMS transformation. And what you end up with, uh, is something which is, of course, not completely unexpected. So you see that the uh, asymptotic part of the shape has something which has the right weight, and these weights have been known forever. It goes with x squared of the super translation parameter, but what is the new bit is how it goes with the super rotation, and you really see the final Schwarzschild derivative. So, of course, we thought we were the first to do Schwarzschild derivatives uh, in. Uh, in four-dimensional flat gravity, but uh, some people already did it before us, as usual. But, but this is the formula that you find for the, uh, for the asymptotic part of the shear. The new tensor is exactly like you expected, like in conformal field theory with the Schwarzschild derivative. And then you have the other transformation. The last transformation law that I want to show you is the one for the Bondi mass aspect. So you find that it goes uh, with certain derivatives of the super translation, and this is how it transforms under super rotation. So it's quite complicated. It, it involves the asymptotic part of the shear, and it even involves a double Schwarzschild derivative, uh, which sits here. So you can ask, is this interesting at all, this transformation law? So let me just give you one instance where it is interesting. Suppose that you are in the standard well-defined case of globally well-defined globally well-defined uh, BMS transformation, your question is, how does the Bondi mass change under supertranslation? So the question would be, how the integral of this object here on the sphere uh, transforms under pure supertranslation? So there's none of this part is here because there are no superrotation. And then you find that this is a total derivative, so the integral will not see it. So you see that the Bondi mass is not affected which is uh, something that people do. OK, I think uh, this is a good moment uh, to stop. Thank you very much. Oh, invite uh, questions or comments. Hakari. Uh, what was the way from all the sink on the horizon of the black hole uh, this BMS? OK, I, some people have tried to do this computation on the horizon. It is true. I've never tried to do it on the horizon, so I don't know. But it is not clear to me. I, I cannot say. I, I, I think, uh, well, I, I have to say I prefer to do things at infinity yeah, for infinity. certain reasons, because I know better what I'm, I'm doing. I'm not so sure what, but well, of course, people have tried. It's not, I don't want to talk about computations I haven't done, so I cannot say. But people have tried similar things. Uh, did anybody try to repeat the whole thing uh, using this kind of Hamiltonian-like approach? Uh, I mean, in terms of constraints, but maybe 
Yeah. Well, okay. Hamiltonian is difficult <laughs> if you have, a, of course, in ADS, the Hamiltonian you really can do because, but here with the null thing, doing the Hamiltonian is really a lot of work. No, but it's also a hypercontinuity from you, like IDM, but concerning yes. this kind of local here by yes, uh, yeah. things, I think, right? Yes, yes, yes. And uh, ideologically, it will be not transparent. Probably, I, I don't know. I, yes, I, I think. You should, you should yeah, well, you know, one can only compute so much, you know, and, and infinity is great. So I'm, I'm happy with that for the moment. Two more. <clears throat> I'm a bit confused about the physical meaning of, of this because we are, you are talking here. Uh, and that was my whole understanding of BMS, of residual gauge freedom only on stripe lines, yes. not taking into account the global fitting of a solution from an incoming mm -hmm. spatial infinity and uh, yes. stripe lines. For instance, if I take a scattering situation, I send two objects, two particles, they come in come out, and, and things like that. Then in that case, although I'm aware there are many subtleties with uh, the Coulomb effects of gravity, the long with massless tail effects and things like that. Um, I think one can connect uh, spy minus and spy plus and have a better gauge, which is rigidly fixed, in which case I would have no residual symmetric group, no? Uh, are you saying that, w what is the physical meaning, finally, of, of what you presented, and including the central charges, for instance, because I was confused. Well, okay, I, uh, I'm not sure I can answer completely. All I can say is that, of course, you can repeat everything that has been done at sky plus at sky minus. Yeah, but you and need to you connect to everything. Connect. And there has been proposals to connect, uh, which are controversial, I guess. I don't know about them. I've never done them. It's, it's a very good question, but this is part of what people are discussing now and maybe should be discussing now also in the GR community. It's not clear to me. Uh, I have to say. So that's one answer. Uh, maybe another answer I can give, I don't know if it's satisfying to you, but about why I believe that this uh, residual gauge symmetry still have really physical meaning. And I, can, I think I can give a good answer in three dimensions, where there aren't gravity waves, so you will only be partly happy. But, so do you want to hear the answer in yes. three dimensions? Yes. OK. So what happens in three dimensions is, so technically, in three dimensions, you have this enormous simplification that you can, that gravity is a chan simons theory. And then you can try to discuss the chan simons theory with a finite boundary or with boundary conditions, which is basically the same thing. Okay. Uh, and if you do that, and you put this asymptotics, of course, then you find that the chan simons theory with this non-trivial asymptotics becomes vesumino witten theory, all you will theory, if you impose all boundary conditions. And you can really prove that in this gauge fixed thing, your asymptotic symmetry of the gravity theory become the global symmetries of the lower dimensional two of the two dimensional theory. So the asymptotic symmetry of the of the uh, of the gravitational case become the global symmetries of the Uville theory, in a sense, mm -hmm. if you want. And so in that sense, they are global symmetries and they are physical, but for a lower dimensional. In that case, I can give a satisfying answer without gravity waves, unfortunately. Is there any situation where one can actually compute a central charge of, of the bulk gravitational theory, either three or four dimensions? Well, uh, yeah. well OK. Uh, in three dimensions, in the anti-decita case, this is the problem. No, no. For, for, for for this case, yeah, yeah. yeah, in three dimensions in the flat case, yeah. this is the first computation we have done for BMS3. So what is the central charge? 3 over G. I see. But it's between the super rotation generator and the super translation generator. There's no problems with poles. In BMS3, super rotations are perfectly well defined because it's just Fourier analysis on the circle. And you have none of these, in a sense. Of course, our greatest disappointment was that if you try to put a value for the central charge for the curved black -like hole, you find zero because the sigma zero of the curved black -like hole naively is zero. And, but we were trying, of course, to play the, the standard kind of games. 
But still, I, I think something could be done. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Uh... <laughs> the last remarks happen to link on to the next talk in the sense that Mihaly Stafos is going to talk to us about some work from the Curse Solution uh, as soon as we get set up. All right. Uh, so I'd like to thank the organizers of this conference for the invitation to speak. Uh, my topic is entirely classical. I will talk about discovering on curved black holes. And the main results that I'll present are all joint work with Igor Rodnyansky and Jakob Stjapentov Roth. So let me uh, begin with, a, with an outline. So most of my talk will actually be about scattering theory for the scalar weight equation on a fixed curve pattern. So that very classical problem will really be uh, most of this talk. Uh, and in particular, I'm going to begin with a discussion of the sort of fixed frequency scattering theory, which is in some sense the most familiar. And then the point of this talk is basically how does one go from fixed frequency scattering theory to, to a true scattering theory in the time domain. And uh, there we'll see that the sort of point of view on asymptotic structure that has been discussed in many of the, the talks in this conference uh, will be very pertinent. And it turns out that sort of this scattering theory, when viewed in the time domain, it has certain subtleties which maybe have not been discussed so much, and I, I hope to, to explain those. Okay, so that will be the main, um, the main part of the talk, but as, a, as an epilogue, I want to actually talk a little bit about the, the actual scattering theory for the Einstein equations themselves. And it turns out that the subtleties that I sort of uh, obliquely refer to, uh, they actually um, point to a certain connection which uh, is dear to, to me, and I hope again to explain it. All right. In any case, off we go. Let me begin a discussion about sort of the fixed frequency scattering theory for the scalar wave equation on curve that many of us know and love. So, um, so essentially, the bulk of literature in in sort of classical black hole scattering theory is is all about this. So, what are what are we to call? Uh, Carter showed quite remarkably that the linear scalar wave equation of x of c equals zero on a curved background, it separates completely into ODEs. This is remarkable because uh, the solution doesn't have uh, sort of enough killing vector fields to uh, a priori um, uh, imply that such separation should hold, but it does because of some hidden structure. So uh, the separation involves three you can think of them as uh, frequency parameters. Omega, which corresponds to you know, d by dt, it's frequency in time. And m and l, m corresponds to the uh, axial killing field d by d phi. And l, you, you can think of as a generalization of the spherical harmonic uh, parameter l. Uh, and for each triple omega m l, then the wave equation uh, reduces to an ODE in a variable which I'll call r star, and the OD is u double prime plus omega squared u equals some potential v times u, where, where this potential, and I'm not going to give you its explicit form, it, it also depends, however, on omega. Okay. So, um, so this is somehow the, the formal uh, sort of uh, fixed frequency uh, approach to understanding the wave equation. Now, if you're already sort of mathematically inclined, let's not think at all of you know, how you would define u starting from an actual solution, because that would involve taking the Fourier transform, or can you actually take the Fourier transform before you know that the solution decays? Let's not even think about that. Just think of this formally speaking. Um, so the study of this OD is fixed frequency scattering. Okay. So, um, so um, already at this fixed frequency level, we can understand uh, one of the very interesting aspects of 
curve that arises when you move from uh, Schwarzschild to Kerr explicitly, and that is the, the celebrated phenomenon of superradiance. So what is superradiance in the fixed frequency picture? Uh, very explicitly, uh, you can understand it as follows. So for each frequency triple, omega m l, uh, you can define two complex valued solutions of the radial ODE, which I'll call u horizon and u infinity. And they are uh, sort of defined through their asymptotic behavior as you go to the horizon. So the horizon in this picture is r star goes to minus infinity and to infinity uh, by this asymptotic. And these oscillating factors are in some sense uh, imposed by the form of the potential, which I haven't given you explicitly. Okay? But it is what it is. So in particular, the uh, oscillating factor in the case of the solution u horizon uh, is this funny omega minus omega plus m, where omega plus is defined by the expression given on these slides. So, um, so you can do this. This is sort of trivial to prove, sort of trivial OD analysis, very well known. And uh, the other thing I should tell you about the potential V is that it's real. And so, in particular, uh, this uh, implies that if uh, U horizon is, let's say, a solution of the radial D, then so is this complex conjugate. So, uh, again, uh, dimensionality tells you that the space of solutions is spanned by U hor and U inf. Footnote, and the footnote is sometimes the most important thing, provided that they are actually linearly independent. In which case, you can write u if as a linear combination of u horizon, and uh, you can write the complex conjugate of uh, u if as a linear combination of u horizon. Okay. So uh, the coefficients are what are known as the transmission and, and reflection coefficients. Okay. So uh, fine. Uh, so if you do all this, then you can write an energy identity for this ODE. And the energy identity uh, will give you this relation, that the uh, square of the modulus of the reflection coefficient plus this factor times the square of the modulus of the transmission coefficient uh, is equal to 1. And superradiance, which was first discussed by Zeldovich, uh, in this picture simply corresponds to the fact that uh, <laughs> if you're in this frequency range of parameters, which is non-trivial as long as a is not equal to zero, then uh, you'll have that uh, the reflection coefficient is bigger than one. So this is to say that there's non-trivial energy amplification at fixed frequency, in the sort of formal sense of fixed frequency uh, scalar theory. So, um, all right, so this is the, the fixed frequency uh, picture, of course, there, there was a, a footnote here that you can only say these things provided that you know that the transmission and the reflection, that the uh, two solutions, u horizon and u infinity, are indeed linearly independent for all real frequency omega. Um, so it could be a priori that that's not the case. And in fact, what that would mean if that were not the case is that without loss of generality, U horizon corresponds to a resonance with, with real frequency. And uh, actually, if U horizon did correspond to a resonance with uh, real frequency, let's say omega naught, then uh, you can easily show that the reflection coefficient R of omega comma m comma L would have to blow up as omega approaches to omega naught. So uh, actually, it, was a, an open problem whether this happened for the wave equation of current until very recently. And so in 2013, uh, Schliapp and showed that there are no resonances on the real axis. And uh, that's to say, for all real frequency omega and, and, and L, these two solutions are indeed really independent. Uh, and thus, uh, the reflection coefficient is well defined for all real frequencies in finite. And this is a generalization of a celebrated mode stability result due to uh, Bernard Whiting, 
uh, back from the 80s, and he showed that there are no finite energy modes for uh, omega in the upper half. Uh, so that had been proven a while ago, but his method of proof did not immediately uh, apply on real axis. So, uh, so that's great. Uh, I want to make one more comment about uh, this. And uh, you might ask yourself, what is it about the curved space-time that makes mode stability for the linear scalar wave equation true? Can you point to a certain feature? Is it because it's asymptotically flat and its ergo region looks like this or that? I will talk more specifically about the ergo region later on. You know, is it something about the horizon, etc.? Uh, and the answer is unfortunately no. Uh, and the best way to see this is uh, to consider the following theorem by uh, Jorgos Mosquitis. So he proved that you can construct axisymmetric stationary space times, actually with all the hidden symmetries of Kerr, uh, which coincide exactly with Kerr in a neighborhood of the ergo region and in the neighborhood of infinity. So they're asymptotically flat, they have a Kerr horizon, an exact Kerr ergo region, and they only differ from Kerr in some band of voyeur liquids R. That's it. And for such solutions, you can, you can sort of tune them so that uh, you have a resonance on the real axis, or if you prefer the upper half plane, you have a growing mode. So what that tells us is that sort of whatever it is about Kerr, which tells you that solutions of the wave equation are stable, it's something special, uh, something global, uh, and something which is still not sufficiently well understood. Uh, so the proof of uh, mode stability by uh, Whiting and uh, Schlappen and Rothman, uh, it exploits certain algebraic transformations of, of these ODs, which are, which are very mysterious and it would be very nice to, to understand why, if there is some fundamental reason that you know, Kerr is stable in the sense why it's the case. Okay, so, uh, so that's something uh, one, can, one can keep in mind. One can also do this with a compactly supported non-negative potential on, on Kerr. Okay. So there's, there's really something subtle, even at this point. Great, uh, turning, turning back to Kerr itself, uh, what schlappin top uh theorem shows is that you can indeed define fixed frequency scattering um, theory. Okay. There are reflection and transmission coefficients that are not infinity. What it doesn't show is uh, whether there's a bound on the reflection coefficient, let's say, which, as we said, is not bounded by one. Uh, so whether there's some bound on the reflection coefficients, maybe uh, depending on the parameters a and m, which is uniform in frequency. So one can define the following you want constant, namely the supremum of the reflection coefficient over all frequencies, so it just depends on the parameters a and m, and you can ask yourself, is this constant finite? And if you want, the first person to really study this was Starobinsky. But this, this question, is this finite, uh, was unknown. And in fact, it's precisely the fact that this was unknown uh, which is an obstruction, or one of the obstructions, to understanding uh, an actual scattering theory in the time domain. Okay. So uh, that's what we're going to go to now, uh, scattering theory in, in the time domain, and at the very end, we're going to come back and make a connection to this and resolve the question of whether, whether this is indeed fine. So what is scattering theory in the time domain? Well, the setup for this is best understood precisely using the panelzygomatic representations that we've seen so much in, in this uh, conference. So let's fix once and for all subextremal curve with some parameters a and m. And let's consider the domain of other communications. And I represent the domain of other communications by its standard Penrose diagram. So we're all to recall that you can think that there are sort of two future boundary components of, of interest and two past boundary components of interest. Uh, the future ones being the future event horizon H plus and future double infinity I plus. And similarly, uh, 
the past ones, past standard horizon H minus, and the somehow past standard infinity I minus. And uh, we're to remember that H plus and H minus, they intersect at the sphere, which I'm considering as part of the domain. It's the sphere of our bifurcation, called B. And so this is the picture we should have in mind of uh, the current domain of other communications. So, um, let, let's recall a few things about the Cauchy problem, and I may write a few things here, if it's not so difficult. So let me just... Can everyone see at least this picture there? I promise not to write it so much. So, as you all know, uh, one can parameterize all solutions of the way the equation be in the Cauchy problem. So, let's consider what I'll call sigma, which is, say, the standard t equals zero, uh, hyperspace or Lindquist coordinates, and I, I consider this to be part of the hyperspace. Okay. And consider, again, for convenience, smooth, compactly supported initial data for the wave equation, so that's initial data which is supported in some region like this, let's say. Then, uh, completely general theorem that you can always uh, solve the wave equation globally. In this region, because, uh, because of, if you want global hyperbolicity. Okay. And so I, I'll call, if you want, the map from initial data to solution, I'll call this forward evolution. Okay? That's forward evolution. And the first proposition to have in mind is the following. Uh, so let's call C the solution to the wave equation. Then RC indeed can be thought of as well-defined on future and past elements. So it's a well-defined smooth function. So uh, this is something that actually can be proven for a wide, very general class of asymptotically flat uh, manifolds. They're now very efficient ways of, of, sort of proving this statement. And this is sort of the <laughs> lemma zero in, in the context of uh, scaling theory. And of course, uh, well, C is certainly manifestly defined on the event horizon H plus, because this is part of the manifold and there's nothing special about the event horizon from the point of view of local theory. Okay, great. So if you want, um, it's um, traditional to call RC the, the Friedlander mediation field. Uh, and we can. If you want, think of, sort of having this as defining a map from initial data, initial data, I'm sort of using this funny uh, font uh, applied to C. Uh, so let me just use that funny notation here. So you can think that this defines some map from initial data, which is this uh, couple, to C on the event horizon, comma, RC on future null infinity. Okay. And what you should think is that the, the forward map of scattering theory all right, should be defined by completing this okay, with respect to some energy norm. Okay. So that's sort of the forward map of scattering. So what, what, what do I mean by a, a, an energy norm? So again, let's recall certain very, very general things that we, we all know very well. So for any vector field X, you can define an energy current uh, and an energy flux via contraction of X with the energy momentum tensor associated to a, a massless scalar field. And if X is causal, then this energy flux is non-negative provided that S is, uh, again, null or, or space. -like. So in particular, you can think that the energy flux of a causal vector field on a space-like hypersurface defines uh, uh, a Hilbert space uh, via completion of, sort of smooth functions. Okay. So, uh, so in particular, uh, that's to say, one can think of, if I have my favorite vector field, I don't know what it's going to be yet. Let me just make it causal. Maybe it's time-like, maybe it's no. Okay. 
then uh, I can find a associated Hilbert space, okay, which is just the completion of smooth, compactly supported functions uh, here with respect to the energy flux given by that expression. Okay. So I have a Hilbert space corresponding to sigma, I have a Hilbert space corresponding to h plus, and the Hilbert space corresponding to future null infinity. So these are the spaces that I'm denoting uh, E sub sigma, E sub h plus, E sub i plus. Okay. So what you can think, if you want, is that the, the problem of scalarity theory in the time domain uh, translates into finding an appropriate causal vector field X such that this map defined on smooth compactly supported functions uh, it induces a, a, a bounded invertible map of Hilbert spaces. Okay. That's to say, uh, a map of Hilbert space, uh, sort of from this energy space to this one direct product with this one, uh, such that the map is bounded, and moreover, you can invert it, and the inverse is bounded. Okay. So this is, uh, as we'll see, everything about scalar theory is incorporated in, in this map, if you can create it. All right, so, Let's, uh, let's try to understand what vector field X you should use to try to find this map. And we'll start with the Schwarzschild case, where there's a very uh, easy answer to that, and very easy to define the scaling theory. So in Schwarzschild, as we all know very well, uh, the killing field d by dt is timeline. And uh, well, the only thing is that, of course, on the event horizon itself, it's not. So it's time like in the sort of strict domain of other communications and now on the event horizon. So in particular, T defines a positive definite energy. And moreover, because T is killing, this energy is conserved. So in particular, uh, that immediately shows that you can complete the forward evolution map to a bounded uh, map of Hilbert spaces from there to there. So the one thing left to do in, in scattering theory is to show that you can actually invert this map. And it turns out that all you need to know to prove that is some very soft information about solutions of the wave equation. Namely, uh, the solutions of the wave equation as you go forward in time, they decay at some, you know, you don't even need a rate of decay. You just need that they decay. And as uh, Harvey mentioned in his talk, uh, that's a very, very sort of general statement for uh, space times with a, with a causal vector field, which is killing, like Schwarzschild. No matter what the space time is, it doesn't need to have any symmetries, anything like that. You always have, in fact, logarithmic decay. Okay? So uh, it, it's an immediate corollary of, of this that uh, you actually have a unitary isomorphism. So if the forward map is unitary, then uh, it's very easy to show that it's, it's invertible. So actually, uh, this was first shown a long, long time ago uh, by uh, Dimok and, and K. And there's another approach to this also uh, by uh, Nicolas. So this is the Schwarzschild case. Um, but Schwarzschild is somehow very, very easy. What happens in Kerr? Well, what happens in Kerr is exactly superated. It's the issue that we already saw from the point of view of this fixed frequency scattering. So now, in the time domain, of course, it's very clear what is the origin of, of uh, superradiance. And again, almost everyone here knows about this already. There is some domain that I'll sort of draw, even though this is not such a good drawing, like this, known as the Erbo region, where the vector field d by dt is spatial. So again, it's not such a great drawing, but let me draw it like this. So in particular, what that means is that this uh, energy flux, which is defined by d by dt, is no longer necessarily non-negative. So in particular, uh, it is no longer true that this energy plus this energy uh, is less than equal to this energy. Okay? In fact, a priori, this energy can be finite, this energy can be infinite, and this energy can be infinite, and this can cancel, and the energy identity can still hold. Okay. So, um, 
So somehow, uh, the, the problem of super radiance, if you want, its origin is exactly the, the, uh, the fact that the, the killing field uh, d by dt is um, spatial. So in trying to define a scattering theory for a curve, we first have to understand what vector field should replace d by dt. d by dt does not define sort of Hilbert spaces here, for instance. Okay. It's not the right definition of the Hilbert space, that's for sure. And moreover, we have to understand, well, given that this map okay, is not going to be unitary anymore with respect to some positive definite conserved thing, what is going to control whether or not it's bounded? That's to say, how much more energy can be radiated here than you had originally? How do you measure that and what controls it? Okay. So this is, if you want, what, what you have to understand to be able to define scalar theory in the time domain. Okay, so let me uh, tell you the main theorems then uh, that one can uh, sort of prove. So the first attempt, if you want, at defining a uh, scalar theory is saying, okay, let's forget about the T energy, okay, because the T energy is not a positive definite thing, okay. Let's define an energy which is manifestly positive definite, and there's no difficulty in doing that. We can choose a vector field, which I'll call N, okay, which is strictly time. And if you want, far away from the black hole, I can make it equal to exactly T. Okay, so this is a strictly time like vector field. Okay. It certainly will allow us to define a Hilbert space here, here, and here. So you might ask yourself, can you define um, a scalar theory? Of course, this is not killing, so this energy will not be conserved. But no one says that that means that you cannot define the scalar map forward and back. So, um, so the first theorem is that indeed you can define for this energy the forward map. And indeed, it's a bounded map of Hilbert spaces. So if I have initially finite energy with respect to some time-like vector field like this, okay. then the energy flux through the horizon and the energy flux through the through null infinity will be bounded by some constant that depends only on the curve parameters, doesn't depend on the initial energy times the initial energy. Okay. So there's some sort of constant of curve that, that uh, determines uh, the amplification as measured from this norm. Okay. So the, the n energy gives us indeed uh, uh, the forward maps of, of scalar. Uh, so let me just say that uh, and this was sort of the way we originally started looking at this problem. Uh, this, this theorem is, is a corollary of a sequence of earlier works uh, of uh, Meinhof, Brodjanski, and uh, Shiavitov, Rosman. Um, on the Cauchy problem. So in these earlier works, we were not interested in scattering theory per se, we were just studying the decay properties of solutions to the Cauchy problem. Um, and if you want, if you sort of try to isolate from that work what was important uh, so that this theorem holds, uh, the important property of Kerr are the following. Well, the mode stability of the real axis, proven by Schiappetov Rothman, this refinement of Whiting. And the following uh, high frequency property that sometimes is, is not uh, said explicitly. So, we all know again from Harvey Real's talk that there are trapped null geodesics. in the current exterior. Now, we all know that those are unstable, but there are, anyway, there are trapped null geodesics. And uh, one thing which is quite worrying about Kerr is that there are even, as long as the parameter A is sufficiently large, there are trapped null geodesics in the air region. So you might be worried that there are wave packets that live for a long time on trapped null geodesics, which, because they're in the ergo region, are moreover amplified in energy. And what's very fortuitous is that 
in frequency space, that's to say if you study carefully the radial of these, you realize that somehow trap frequencies, frequencies associated with such geodesics, are not superradiant, even though in the physical space they lie in the outer region. So that's, uh, so that's one aspect uh, which is important. And another aspect which is important is the celebrated redshift effect. So the sort of energy seen by this observer, you know, and if you think of N as defining an observer, is naturally redshifted along the horizon. Okay. And that's a, that's a stability mechanism. Now, interestingly, all three of these uh, helpful properties degenerate as you approach extremality. And, uh, well, very little is known uh, in general about the, the extremal case, and I'll maybe say some more later. OK, so that's great. The forward theory sort of is completely solved by this M energy. But uh, if you think about it a little bit, you realize that you can never, you should never have expected to be able to invert this map for the N energy. So, um, and the reason is related to exactly what I said. You see, when you solve forward in time the wave equation, uh, then somehow this energy on the horizon, in the geometric optics approximation at least, is redshifted. But what that means is if I think of putting initial data here, and here, and here, and solving backwards, this energy is blue shifted. And uh, you can actually prove uh, explicitly that this map, this forward map in the Hilbert space is defined by this energy, uh, is not uh, surjective. So in particular, uh, the, let's say, space of uh, finite energy uh, radiation fields with respect to this energy, okay, do not all correspond to scattering states uh, for finite this energy again solutions of the wave equation. There are too many such states. Okay. So uh, let me make a little aside that uh, okay. So the, the this map is not subjective, but you can actually. Uh, identify some uh, radiation fields which are in its image. And uh, what, what you can do is you can require that uh, not only the N energy here, let's say, be finite, but the N energy be finite if I also put an exponentially growing wave. With exponential power actually related to the surface gravity. So if you do that here and here, you create these spaces, which are denoted with this uh, awful notation. And uh, for energy, for initial data, for scattering data, if you want, in, in those spaces, you can solve backwards. And the reason is, again, not very surprising that this exponential uh, factor, uh, it dwarfs the, the redshift, okay, which is seen as a blue shift. Okay. So you're making your data decay fast enough so that even though it's redshifted, well, it's blue shifted as you go backwards. Uh, so what you get at the end is still fine. And that actually, uh, sort of, a corollary of this analysis is the following. Uh, if you want to sort of identify a class of general initial data with this property, uh, you, you have to put exponential weights. If you put polynomial weights, no matter how fast the decay is, you cannot do so this is already pretty funny because, of course, if I take generic smooth initial data and solve forward, we all know that we expect to have polynomial decay rates here and here. This is telling me that if I take sort of just general functions here and here with polynomial decay weights and try to solve backwards, I will not be in the energy space. That's to say my solution will be singular at the event. And we'll get back to this uh, issue uh, later uh, in the talk. So this may make you very, very uh, worried about the possibility of defining any sort of 
scattering theory on curve. But it turns out that there is a solution, uh, there is a space in which you can indeed define scattering theory on curve. And this is uh, defined by yet another energy, which I'll call the, the V energy. So what is the V energy? Well, the V energy is a energy associated to a killing field, to a causal vector field V with the forward properties. In the neighborhood of the horizon, it's uh, identical with the so-called Hawking vector field. So this is a vector field which is now on the horizon and time-like in a little neighborhood of the horizon. Okay? Near infinity, V is just going to be d by dt. And, well, in some intermediate region, it's just some who knows what time-like vector field which smoothly connects between the two. So this is not a killing field. Okay? In particular, it's not killing in this intermediate region. But it's causal. So uh, the point about this vector field is that, again, if you look at energy with respect to this vector field in the geometric optics approximation on the event horizon, it's no longer redshift. Somehow that, this energy, because it doesn't see all of the local energy, does not see the part of the energy which is redshifted. So going backwards, to say it another way, it, it does not see this, this blue shift. So um, it, maybe I should say that, of course, this uh, vector field V, in the Schwarzschild case, you can just take it equal to Bt, okay? Uh, because the Hawking vector field is exactly T. Uh, in Kerr, you can easily prove that there is no killing field which is globally caused in this sense. So, um, so the third main theorem is that, well, the forward map with respect to this energy is again bounded. And if you want the proof of this, uh, it's, it's actually more technical than the proof of the original theorem because the redshift for the forward map is helpful. So now you have to reprove boundedness without you know, being able to use the good properties of the redshift. Okay. And now it turns out that indeed uh, you can show, it's well, so difficult once you've, you've shown uh, theorem 3, that uh, there exists a bounded map uh, from these silver spaces which inverts uh, the, uh, the forward map. So this vector field B is indeed the key to defining uh, energy. So, um, very good. Uh, Maybe I should say explicitly, so immediately uh, it's sort of uh, nice to talk in scattering theory about uh, the S matrix. So uh, everything that I said concerning the maps from initial data to these spaces uh, sort of is equally valid concerning the map from initial data to these spaces. Okay. So in particular, uh, this map is also invertible, and you can compose now this inverse with, with the forward map, and this gives you uh, the, the scattering matrix. Okay. So, um, so corollary is that the, the scattering matrix, which you, you should think of as a map from this Hilbert space uh, plus that Hilbert space to this Hilbert space plus that Hilbert space, is a bounded invertible map. And the boundedness is the quantitative replacement for unitary. The boundedness tells you that, OK, there is super radiance, but there is a universal bound, depending only on the parameters, of how much energy you can indeed uh, get out. Okay. So this is, if you want, the wave analog of the bounds on the sort of efficiency of the Penrose uh, process that uh, we're studying by many people, including uh, so, um, let me just say a, a few more things uh, uh, explicitly. So, you can now restrict this general scattering matrix uh, to the special class of initial data, which is zero on the past horizon. Okay. And if you want, what I can then decompose the scattering matrix into the map here and the map there. So, this map I'll call the transmission map, and this map I'll call the reflection map. So, of course, uh, these maps are also bounded. It's a corollary of the statement. 
and these knots to connect with the uh, finite theory, uh, these maps are what is related to the fixed frequency uh, of the E theory. And in fact, uh, these maps can be written a posteriori as uh, sort of, you know, by uh, thinking of Fourier transforming your data here, okay, and multiplying by either the transmission or the reflection coefficient with suitable factors that have to do with you know, Omega derivatives. So, in particular, if you want, the Hilbert space norm of this operator, R, is precisely equal to the supremum of the reflection uh, coefficient over all frequencies. So, the statement that this is a bounded operator is the same as the statement that uh, this supremum is indeed bounded. So, if you want, the corollary uh, answers the, the question that we started with about fixed frequency scattering theory, that there is a uniform bound uh, for the reflection uh, and transmission coefficient in terms of the initial bound. So another thing that's very easy to show is that uh, there are sort of this uh, sort of uh, Hilbert space operator norm R, uh, as long as A is not zero, is indeed strictly positive, that's to say there are, you can construct wave packets uh, for which the energy here is indeed bigger than the original energy, this is actually a, a trivial consequence of, uh, sort of these relations and what we know about the coefficient of fixed frequency. Okay, uh, maybe I'll say one more thing about this, which is the following. So, uh, so in particular, of course, uh, these theorems immediately tell you the fact that these are isomorphisms, that uh, if your sort of initial Scattering data in the past is zero here and here, that the solution is zero everywhere. And similarly, they immediately tell you that if the solution is zero here and zero here, it will be zero everywhere. But you might ask uh, different questions, like the following uh, Suppose my solution is zero here and there, is it zero everywhere? Or, um, Let's say, suppose I know that it's zero on scribe plus and scribe minus. Is it zero everywhere? And uh, th th this is a sort of the more subtle question a priori, you might think, because of course it's well known that uh, these problems, thought of as initial value problems, if you try to solve the wave equation this way or this way, then they're ill cost. So you certainly cannot define forward maps this way and that way. That's out of the question. But it turns out that it, it, it <laughs> yes, you cannot define the forward maps, but uh, it's still the case that you have this uniqueness. Okay. So, uh, indeed, uh, you have, um, uh, if, if you want to think about it this way, uh, these maps are injected. So, so a, a, a solution, solution uh, these maps are all injected. So a solution, you, you can pick any two of these boundary components. If you're zero on, on two of them, doesn't matter which two. In fact, even these two, that's a very strange problem to try to solve in value of four. Uh, the solution is it. OK. So, so this is just the, the, the comment that somehow uh, this type of uh, statements, uh, they are true, these last statements about the exact curve, it would be very difficult to prove these type of statements for a perturbation curve. So you're really using the stationarity. And uh, I'll make one other comment which I think emphasizes the difference between the, the fixed scattering theory and the time domain scattering theory. Actually, the sort of for the fixed frequency theorem, you should think that the whole definition of reflection coefficients, if you think about this U horizon, complex conjugate U horizon, corresponded to solving this problem at fixed frequency. So for fixed frequency, you can solve the analog of this problem, whatever that means. And in fact, you use that to set up scattering theory. 
in the time domain, you can never solve this problem. But nonetheless, the, the fixed frequency theory and what's proven allows you to show this uniqueness. OK, so uh, let me finally uh, turn to the epilogue of the talk uh, with, with this funny uh, title, Taming Blue Shift Instabilities and the Relation with Black Hole Interiors. So, uh, OK, so all this about the scalar wave equation on a fixed curve background is baby stuff. What we'd really be interested in is showing scalar theory for nonlinear generalizations of the scalar wave equation. And in fact, okay, the ultimate such generalization we'd be interested in is a scalar theory for the Einstein vacuum equations themselves. So this is exactly what Thibault D'Amour was talking about at the end of the last talk. So uh, for reasons that have to do with comments that I just said, the problem in, in the black hole case of characterizing um, the scattering data of general solutions of the Einstein black hole cases, even, let's say, close to her solution, it's a very difficult problem for reasons that we'll see. But the first problem you might want to ask is the following. Can you create some solutions of the Einstein black hole equations near her by imposing scattering data and just solving the action equations afterwards, just like we were defining the backwards maps. So uh, uh, there is a result in this direction, and this is a theorem from a few years ago, which I proved with uh, Gustav von Segel from Imperial in the of analysis. And said so the following. Yes, you can impose scattering data for the action equations here and here, Scattering the value of the Einstein equations on fusion of infinity is all this ugly stuff that we heard about in the last talk. Uh, okay? And the analogous ugly stuff on the quantum D and event horizon. Provided that you impose that the radiation the degrees of freedom decay in suitable sense along the other thing exponentially at a suitably fast. So it's exactly, if you want, the analog of the backwards map for the end theory for the scalar wave equation. And the reason that you require a suitably fast exponential rate is precisely the redshift at the horizon, which becomes a fusion. Okay. I'm sorry? Uh, it's not good. Okay. So, um, so actually, uh, this theorem, even this theorem, whose proof is not as hard as you might think, uh, it, there is a subtlety, uh, which is the following. Uh, this theorem, its analog is not true for any old nonlinear set of wave equations with quadratic nonlinearities. Uh, it really means the fact that the quadratic nonlinearities in the Einstein equations are good. And the reason is that for the generic theory with quadratic nonlinearities, even if I pose initial data here and here and try to solve backwards, I would not be able to. So this, this uh, theorem, you really need the sort of null structure of the Einstein equations. And it's actually, it would be difficult to prove this directly in harmonic orbits, although not impossible, provided that you find some way of identifying that structure. Um, so you might ask yourself the following. Um, okay, that's great. I've identified this class of scattering data for which I can indeed solve backwards. And by the way, this class includes Robinson, Troutman, and space times that have been discussed earlier. But of course, I know that the generic solution of the forward problem, if I believe in all the work that's been done over the years, uh, will have not exponentially decaying tails, but polynomially decaying tails. In fact, with, sufficient, with particular numerology. So uh, the results that uh, one has for the wave equation, uh, they tell you that even for a linear equation, if I just started with some old radiation field here decaying polynomially and some old field decaying here and so backwards, I would get something for the linear problem, which is singular here. So 
So if the Einstein equations were any old nonlinear equation, you know, okay, the linear thing already blows up, you know, you put in something blows up back in the nonlinear terms, that would suggest that you cannot solve at all the scattering problem for such data. You would always sort of get singularity that is going like this, and then it wouldn't make sense to even say that your solution solved the scattering. But, uh, <laughs> but actually, uh, again, the, the Einstein equations are better than uh, the sort of generic nonlinear equation, and this is something that we've learned from black hole interiors. So uh, there's a similar blue shift instability, which is very well known, which happens in the, the current interior. So everyone knows that the, in the interior, the current solution has a Cauchy horizon. And it was Roger Penrose who first remarked that associated to this Cauchy horizon is a blue shift instability, which is exactly the same as the sort of backwards blue shift instability associated to this backwards scattering map. And as a result of that, uh, one might lead to conjecture the original form of strong cosmic censorship, which is if I wiggle this initial data ever so slightly, then uh, the solution will not have a Cauchy horizon, but will break down in a space like singular. So, actually, I proved recently with Jonathan Luke that uh, that's not the case. Uh, in fact, as long as the exterior of the curve space time is stable, which is something that is uh, universally believe, then uh, it turns out that the entire Penrose diagram of the curve solution is stable to small perturbation. So small perturbations of uh, Kerr uh, have a sort of globally null boundary, but uh, the proof suggests that generically this null boundary is singular. So a version of strong cosmic censorship is still true as long as you sort of also allow null singularities as part of the formulation. Um, so in particular, there, there's no space-like part of the singularity here. So, and this is my final slide. Uh, this, interpreted is backwards, suggests the following conjecture. That if I start with uh, a radiation field which is polynomially decaying, and another one which is polynomially decaying, and these are just some two generic independent choices, and I solve backwards, I can solve. There will not be breakdown sort of accumulating at this point, which would not allow me to solve at all. Okay? But the solution, like the purely linear problem, will have a, a null singularity on the event horizon. So, um, <laughs> why is this not in contradiction with what we know about the forward world, or what we hope is true about the forward world? For generic smooth initial data of the forward problem, Okay? Then conjecturally, you have exactly polynomial decay here and polynomial decay there. But those two sort of polynomial decay rates are correlated. That's to say, the radiation field here is not independent of the radiation field here in its sort of asymptotic behavior. There are correlations at every, every single level of the asymptotic expansion. And unless you can identify those correlations, okay, then you can <laughs> you do not know that this and this came from smooth data. So the information that your, your radiation field came from smooth data is very, very uh, subtle somehow, and it's uh, incorporated uh, there. Uh, so it, I think it would be a, a very interesting problem to understand this. Uh, one final remark. Uh, you can in some other aspects of the recent literature, uh, event horizons which are singular are very popular and have received a lot of attention. Y you see, even in classical GR, if you do not know uh, what is the right scattering data and you solve backwards, you will think that the event horizon is singular. But at least in classical GR, we know very well what is the right class of space times. It's those that arise from smooth initial data. So we don't uh, fall into any paradoxes in classical geometry, even though we, we see this picture also. Thanks. Questions? Uh, 
No, no, I mean, there's no, no. I mean, it's not, somehow at, at the level of Koshi data, you know, there's nothing sort of special uh, about that. Sorry? Oh, this is a uh, mosquito. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, you, you fix completely the. the Very, it's very unclear. I mean, to put it, it, it's maybe even better to look at the case of a positive potential, which is compactly supported on curve. So it's known that if you look at the Klein Gordon equation on, on curve, you have black hole home, and that corresponds to exponential growth, actually. Schlappen for Brockman can prove rigorously that indeed you have uh, sort of growing mode solutions for that. But that's, of course, because the, the, the Klein Gordon potential effectively acts like a mirror. Uh, but what uh, Mosidi showed is that you can fix the current metric exactly, and you can put the compactly supported, no negative potential. So you're not introducing any more negative energy, and it's compactly supported, so there's no. And it, you can design the potential so that, again, you have a black hole model. Um, and so certainly this is something that has nothing to do with the high frequency hit. Okay, so it's, there's nothing about traffic, or it's, it's a low frequency phenomenon. And, you know, it's just magical that Kerr happens to be the case, but, and and we don't know. And in, in particular, I should say uh, explicitly that uh, you know this is a problem that you can understand at the level of ODEs if you want. Uh, this constant, you can call it the Starogensky constant if you want. Uh, no one knows as uh, m as a approaches m if if this is fine. This is not. Yes. Yeah, it is. It is. What's more data? Well, I mean, again, yeah, I mean, it's all about sort of space times which are right, settling down to curve. So, in, in some sense, they're a small data. Yeah. That's a small, smallest problem. Yeah, I mean, for large data. Oh. You go to higher dimensions and then you don't, you know, have any, it's not clear what you change other than the coefficients here and there. It's not, it's not clear what geometric property you've lost. So, you know, it just maybe that that's life. I mean, it's, it's a magical property of, of curve. But it, one often forgets this fact that there, there is no good given reason why um, even just the scalar wave equation on, on curve should not. Uh, have exponentially growing solutions. It's not, you know, because of some property that you can you can point to, and the the proof of that is sort of, you know, it really uh, uses very magical algebraic transformation properties of, of you know, the ODE in certain variables. So, is that is that the only understanding that I have of that phenomenon? No. Okay. Well, thank you very much indeed for an enjoyable talk.